We're here in Davos. So we had Liu He, who's the vice premier of China here for a while, but then he had to go to Zurich to meet with Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary, to start some discussions, maybe some back and forth. Mm -hmm. Give us the trade equivalent of that. What should we take away from that meeting, and what are you doing with your equivalents over in Beijing? Sure. Well, um, Liu He is uh, the vice premier in charge of the uh, economic profile. So he's uh, Janet's counterpart. He's also mine. Uh, our schedules did not intersect, things being what they are. Uh, but uh, after Bali last fall and the G20 meeting between the presidents, uh, both presidents turned to their teams and instructed us to engage. And so that's what you see uh, Janet doing. Um, <clears throat> I will do the same um, with respect to trade. I think that um, the expectations expectations for everyone, um, workers, families, businesses in America, um, in China, around the world, um, should be that President Biden uh, is committed to bringing a thoughtful, deliberate, strategic, and ultimately effective approach to the challenges that we have, as well as the opportunities that we have in this uh, profoundly consequential trade relationship. Deliberate is a terribly important word. Uh, part of the backdrop to the relationship right now between the United States and China yes. is the, uh, those Section 301 sanctions. Mm -hmm. that are now under review. President Biden indicated at one point he thought he might address that last summer, didn't. You've got comments now. Do you have a sense of when you may be ruling on the 301? Um, so it's a statutory requirement, so we'll have statutory parameters, but uh, we are committed at USTR uh, to carry out President Biden's vision. The spirit of his approach um, to uh, economic leadership, including in this area, uh, we are going to bring a disciplined approach to the feedback that um, our public has provided us. Uh, there's no more important aspect of our work, especially in the management of this relationship. Uh, we're here in uh, Switzerland, uh, very near the EU. There's a lot of issues over here right now being talked about, frankly, at Davos, mm -hmm. coming out of the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, yes. and particularly some of the electric vehicle uh, tax credits mm -hmm. uh, that are seen in some as protections. Actually, we have uh, a member of the British uh, cabinet today actually saying that he thinks they're dangerous because they really smack of protectionism. What's your response? Um, I've had a lot of conversations with our friends and allies around these provisions. Uh, and I understand that they have concerns. Um, our conversations, uh, which are being built on uh, with our engagements here at Davos, are um, uh, constructive, they're honest. But I do want to draw everyone's attention to the fact that uh, in public and also in private, all of them have been clear that they absolutely share the goal of addressing the climate crisis and that they see this legislation as a significant accomplishment on the part of President Biden in making America's contribution. So um, I have every confidence, given the track record we've had in working with our partners and allies and working through issues, and every confidence that given the shared values that we have, that uh, we will be able to find a way to work together to address the challenge that, frankly, we are all also uh, being affected by together. Well, we talked earlier today actually with the Director General of the WTO and she said she is hopeful that it will be resolved through negotiations and discussions rather than through a dispute resolution mechanism with WTO. Is there room under the statute though to do that? Is there room under the statute to do that? Um, look, there is always room to have that political conversation. There is always, always room to understand each other better and to um, uh, map out uh, a path ahead where we can be working together cooperatively on something that is so important to all of us. Uh, so, so as you think about uh, implementing this, is it possible that in fact a competition between the United States and Europe on subsidizing green energy might be a good thing? Might that be a good thing actually to have a little bit of, a, I won't call it a war, but at least a competition? Um, you know, coming from these open market systems, um, we put a lot of faith in uh, competition, on the ability of competition to make us better, uh, to motivate um, our market participants. So in that sense, healthy competition is always welcome and is a part of the logic of the economies that we have. Um, I have heard people, you know, very concerned say, well, what we don't want is a subsidies raise. No one disagrees with that. And so I think that if we focus on what healthy competition looks like, um, <clears throat> where cooperation is required, uh, again, our track record uh, has demonstrated our ability time and again to work through thorny issues.
Uh, we tend to focus in the media I'm talking about now on China and Europe when we talk about trade. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about Sub-Saharan Africa, oh, actually, because President Biden traveled over there. There is a statute right now that allows some uh, countries, I understand, to act duty-free with respect to the United States. It needs to be renewed. Yes. There's also some investment in digital. Give us your sense of the Biden administration approach yes. to Sub-Saharan Africa, some of the countries that need the help the most. Sure. So President Biden hosted the African leaders um, at a summit in December in Washington, D.C. And um, I think it came at just the right time. Uh, the message um, that we wanted to send across the board, across the administration, was that uh, America is ready to partner with Africa, to work for Africa, with Africa. On trade, we've got our uh, baseline trade program. It's a preference program. It's called the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Uh, it is um, set to be um, uh, uh, reauthorized uh, in 2025. Now is exactly the right time to be reviewing uh, what performance has been like, how effective has this been in um, stimulating and fostering development uh, economic development and investment uh, in our uh, partner economies, and then also to start thinking, how do we make this better and more effective? It is very clear from all of the engagements that we had last December in Washington, D.C., including um, my trip to Nairobi for President Ruto's inauguration in September, um, the future really is Africa. The resources in Africa, whether they are in the ground or that they are the human beings, the people of Africa, the potential is tremendous. If we can find the way through trade, economics, investment, finance, to unlock the potential of Africa and its people, Africa could be the engine that drives economic growth and prosperity for the next phase of globalization, but it is going to require us to think big and to be creative because the tools that we have so far um, haven't done what we know we need to do in this next phase. President Biden also just recently traveled to Mexico City for a North American uh, yes. summit meeting with the head of Canada, Mexico, as well as President Biden. There are trade issues pending under the UMC, USMCA and other places, particularly involving energy. Mm -hmm. Where do those stand? Are they being resolved? What's the timetable? So um, there is an energy uh, consultation that we are engaged in right now. Uh, both the United States and Canada have requested consultations with, um, with Mexico. Those consultations are ongoing. <clears throat> um, we uh, um, uh, have certainly gotten Mexico's attention. <laughs> they know we care deeply about this. Our economies are and have been inextricably linked for many decades now. And we are the kind of partners, we are neighbors. Geography is never going to change. We're going to be neighbors forever. So um, these are really important conversations. They are about energy policy. They are about um, uh, our vision for a competitive North American future. Uh, we are uh, still in consultations um, and uh, we are committed uh, to finding a solution here using whatever tools are available, including the ones under the USMCA. One last one, if I could. Uh, you obviously have been very busy. You have a lot on your plate. Not a lot of free trade agreement negotiations that at least I've picked up on. Mm -hmm. And I wonder about that as an overall policy matter. I talked actually, as I said, to the Director General of the WTO, and, and ex she expressed some concern about global growth, mm -hmm. economic growth. If we move away from a globalized system of mm -hmm. trade into more of blocks, mm -hmm. is that a concern for the Biden administration? And if so, how do we avoid it? So um, if we're looking at uh, regionalization, this is actually a natural outgrowth of the analysis and diagnosis that we've done around supply chain fragility. And I know this is something that um, everyone here in Davos, uh, but also everybody at the kitchen table is talking about these days, which is supply chains and how they impact our daily lives, uh, our livelihoods and um, our experiences just being normal human beings. Uh, so we're all trying to think about um, how we can change incentives, change firm behavior, uh, change um, uh, parameters and rules to incentivize resilience. And I think that a part of the solution is to look at how concentrated some supply chains have become, how far flung certain links in supply chains are, and to think about whether or not there is a solution in regionalization. Mm -hmm. Not to, um, not to uh, beggar any of our farther flung neighbors, but to produce more options and more diversification so that when the next shock happens, whatever source mm -hmm. 
that shock may come from, that our global economy will not meet with a catastrophic halt, that we will have systems that create resilience and allow us a cushion uh, to uh, continue mm -hmm. on.